Hey, -o. welcome back to our authorization and user account Golang tutorial. Today, we'll create a handler, service method, and repository method for updating a user's details. If we go back to our fancy schmancy diagram, I've highlighted what we will work on today. We'll make a put endpoint on the details route here, slash details, that will have a handler that reaches out to an update details service in the user service, which will then reach out to an update method on our user repository, which works with our Postgres database. This put method will need to be passed through the auth user middleware because we want the user to only be able to update their details. Therefore, we will apply this middleware to this handler. I want to open the user model struct that we have in the model folder in the user file. The handler that we're going to make today and its accompanying functionality and services will be able to update a user's email, name, and their website as well. We won't add the ability in this application to cancel a user or to update their password or even to verify email. This handler will simply update the possible text fields. Later, we're going to make a separate endpoint that will update a user's image. Perhaps we could have put this in a separate entity or model. There are a lot of ways to do this. But to keep the database table simple and this tutorial from going on forever, I will add the user image URL to this actual struct as well. This maybe is not strictly RESTful or maybe not strictly clean architecture, but I'm content with this. As always, let's go to our interfaces and define some method definitions for first our user service. We'll create an up de update details method, which takes the context and a user to update. And this will end up containing the name, the email, and the website of that user that we want to update. And we'll get back the full details from the database when they're updated. Next, let's add an update method to the user repository. And this will have a very similar signature. It will only return an error in the case that there's an error otherwise this user will be updated with up-to-date details from the database. If I save these files, I have warnings about lack of implementing these methods. So let's go ahead and first just add some boilerplate to our mocks. Let's go to user service first. Let us scroll to the bottom and create a method that just has the desired signature and handles the possible returning of an error. Let's do the same in user repository now. Let's scroll down and this will have practically the same signature. Now we need to work on the concrete implementations of these methods. Let's close up this model. Let's go to the repository layer first. Usually I like to work from the service layer. I don't know if it's inward or outward, but towards the repository. But in this case, let's go ahead and actually, I want to work on the repository. Let's work on the Postgres user repositories update method. I'll add it at the bottom of PG user repository, and this will introduce a couple of new principles. You can see here that we create a multi-line query string. I don't want to focus on the fact that it's multi-line, but remember that when we use any sort of placeholder, we would usually use name equals, and then maybe like dollar sign one, dollar sign two, and three. But SQLX, the library we're using on top of uh, SQL, allows us to use these named placeholders with colon name, colon email, and colon website. From this, we can create a prepared named statement. That's what this end statement means. And then this could fail, so we'll possibly return an error. And what we can then do with this name statement is use a get function and we pass in a user. So basically the user has a name field, an email field, and a website field, and those will be put into this query and sanitized by the library. And I guess it does escaping and, and makes it a safe string. I hope at least. <laughs> I should maybe go look at the code, but that's what these libraries are supposed to do. Anyhow, we use a get statement, and what that does is it ends up returning 
the values from this query. Notice that we return all of the columns from this query, and then it will put them back into the user. So we're kind of mutating the user, and that's why you see u and u. Again, I might return the user if I had to do this again. I think this is a little confusing. You'd have to comment your code, and it might not be the easiest thing for another developer to do. Anyhow, if this query somehow fails, we'll return an internal server error. Otherwise, we do not return any error. Let's now go to the service layer. And we have a user service here. And let's scroll down. And we'll add the implementation for updating the user here. This method is called update details. Here it is. It takes a context in a user. And it just reaches out to that update method we just created. If there's an error, we'll return it. Now, I could have just returned the call to this function, but since I don't know if we're going to actually add events to this application or not for sort of microservices architecture where if you update a user, you want some other application to also be able to update their record of the user. Uh, here is where we would reach out to some events broker. In my case, it was Google Cloud PubSub. It could be Kafka or Nat's streaming server or something like that, RabbitMQ you could publish the updated event. Now, I just named a whole bunch of uh, events, uh, libraries there, or tools, and I'm not an expert or know which would absolutely be the best. I'm sure there's a lot to learn there. Now, let's get to work on the handler layer. So let's go to handler and the actual handler.go file. I'm going to close out a lot of these files and then open up handler.go. We're going to apply the auth middleware to this endpoint. So we have, oh, I scrolled a whole bunch there. <laughs> we have the details here. Let's cut this and let's scroll back up. I keep switching between Mac and Windows and I have my scroll in the opposite direction. I should probably be consistent. <laughs> here we go anyway. Let's copy this middleware to apply it to our details endpoint if we are not in test mode. And then if we are in test mode, I should have just copied this twice first. We will handle it without the middleware here. Similar as we did with other endpoints. Of course, we need this middleware to get the user ID to know who to update and to make sure that not just anyone can update another user. As we've done a lot of, let's create a new file here called details.go for the name of the handler. Let's make this a package handler and then we'll go back to handler and we should find our details method here and we can cut this and wow we're we're almost there guys we only have two more methods I, I honestly don't know if i thought we would get this far maybe i should not tell you that all right so here's the start of our method i'll have to see what this error was i don't know before we really make the method let's create this struct for our expected request so I'll call this the details request. I don't know what that is still. Let's save this again. Maybe I hadn't saved this handler file and something went wrong. Anyway, this details request can receive JSON of name, and that's in these struct tags here, email and website, and that will bind these JSON fields to these struct fields. I guess I'm repeating myself. We've gone over this about 10 times. And then we use the binding to use Go Playground Validator. And I believe that these validators are computed sequentially. So what that means is we first check if there is no name field in the JSON. If there isn't, we just ignore it. We will not return an error. It will just use an empty name field. So the user or the client has to be aware of that. If you don't put a name field, your user's new name is going to be empty. However, if it is not empty, it must not be any longer than 40 characters, though, you know, let's, let's make this 50. Some people have long names. <laughs> All right. And then the email address, similar deal. If it's empty, then we replace their email with an empty email address. Now that I think about it, maybe we should make this required, but I guess we're old fashioned. You don't have to have an email. No account recovery here. Otherwise, we'll use the provided email validator that is part of the Go Playground validator library. Then we do a similar thing with the website and we use the built-in URL validator. Let's add some of the logic for this now. 
I will get rid of this placeholder return. It's details. <laughs> All right, let's save this and let's see what the heck I did. The first thing I do is get the authorized user from the middleware or the middleware puts this user on the user key and then I cast it to a user. And I just use must get that will panic if there's a problem. We should not get to this endpoint if there is not a user. If you want to use just a regular get and check for an error, by all means do that or refactor it into some other function you can use in all of your authorized handlers. We'll then use our bind data method that handles all of this validation. And if all goes well, it will bind all of the details or the JSON to this rec variable. If there's an error, this bind data will send a bad request to the user or client. I keep saying user, but it's any sort of client. It could be a machine. We then create a model user from the auth user ID, and then we update the fields with name, email, and website. We extract the request context, and then we call our user service update details. We check for any errors, which the, if there are, we will forward them on in JSON and get the status. And if all goes well, we will return the user. Now, since we don't update the image, we could end up getting an image URL back for the user in this JSON, which we will see in Postman. All right, I think we are ready to run this. As always, if you want to see some testing for details or updated testing for the service layer user service uh, to this file user service test.go, go ahead and check out the repository in the show description. Let's now go to the terminal and let's cd up one directory, not cd, not like a sketchy neighborhood, but cd, and let's run docker compose up and let's cross our fingers and hope this runs. All right, it looks like all our handlers are up. First, let's go into our Redis database. So hopefully it loads now because I just started it. All right, and we can go to our users table. I'm just going to right click and show all rows so I don't have to write the query. And we currently have a whole bunch of users, guy one, two, and three. You can see that they have no names or image URLs. Remember I said that if the user already has a user Im image URL, even though we can't update it at this endpoint, it's possible that it can be returned. So let's add a URL here. I'm going to just uh, add my actual <laughs> profile image from my blog or personal, I guess it's not a blog, it's my developer profile. And we'll update that. All right, so this user, uh, guy02, take note of that, has no name but they do have guy02 email and no website. So let's go to Postman now. The first thing I want to do is try to update details without any signed in user. <laughs> and I was playing around and I made a Moana uh, name. Here, let's send this. And hopefully we should get some sort of auth error here. Good, so provided token is invalid. So let's sign in this user. And remember when I sign in a user, I set a variable in this test called ID token. Let's go back to the body and we need to sign in guy02. There we go, we have an ID token and my details handler or uh, request here has an authorization tab and I'm using bearer token with that ID token we just extracted. The body here, let's call this uh, guy. Jew, that's like an Italian name or something. I don't know. All right. And then we'll say, we'll change the email address to guy02, um, the year 2021 at guy.com. And then we'll make guy's website is actually my website. So self promotion here, I guess, at jacobgoodwin.me. I guess there was no reason to change any of this, but let's update it. Let's send. Excellent, and you can see we still have that profile image that was in the database here. Let's go back to PG Admin and make sure these were updated. And let me cancel this and hit play to update. All right, we have those names and fields that we just updated. Now to show what happens if we leave a field empty, remember I had the omit empty in the JSON tags. If I send this, 
Now you see the user has no name, and that's what I was referring to before. Let's check just for fun if validation works. Let's say at com, there's no uh, domain here. Bad request, we have an invalid email. So go ahead and play around with this. The validation should work pretty well. All right, guys, that was a little bit shorter. I'm going to try to put one of these out every five or six days instead of every week and may maybe faster. I'm going to queue them up and then hopefully take vacation, to be honest. <laughs> but thanks for joining me again. Next time, I think we're going to work on signing up for Google Cloud so that we can use their cloud storage to store the user's image. I'm also thinking about just using some of lo some sort of local file storage because maybe it's hard for some people in your countries to access Google Cloud. If you have an opinion, you have like a day <laughs> to let me know. Actually, I'm probably going to film the video before this one is released, but I'll decide if I'm going to use local storage or Google Cloud, and I suppose you'll have to suffer through it. Thanks for joining me again. I'm talking way too much now. Have a good one. Hasta luego. Ciao.